My name is Elizabeth Raw. I lead the Bond Deterrence Project here at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute. And I'm delighted to be speaking with Michael Chertoff, who we all know as the former uh, Secretary of the DHS in the United States, uh, where he experienced many contingencies. Although I think it's safe to say, Michael, none as far reaching as the coronavirus crisis that is. Uh, putting the whole world in, in a sort of a, a bind with governments and the rest of us unsure what to do or how to get out of it. Uh, so Michael, can I ask you, uh, which lessons have you learned so far from the coronavirus crisis? Well, I think these <clears throat> lessons are really reinforcements of things that I always knew because back when we planned for the possibility of a pandemic or a, even a biological attack <clears throat> 15 years ago, we understood that, first of all, you had to have detailed planning and preparation in order to be ready for an emergency like this. It's not something you can just pick up as a routine matter or do on the, on the spur of the moment, but you need to have thought through what capabilities you need, what authorities you need, and what your first steps would be. And I think one of the lessons of this crisis was we kind of lost some of the sharpness we had developed 15 years ago. And so we had to try to rebuild on the fly, and that's, that's quite difficult. The second lesson, which I think is a deeper lesson, is the importance of resilience. And resilience means the ability to have a certain amount of redundancy, or what we sometimes call a plan B, to deal with an unexpected problem if your initial impulse or initial program doesn't work properly. And we do live in a world where, in both the public and the private sector, there's a great deal of emphasis on efficiency and cost cutting and really streamlining everything so there's no excess and everything is just arriving when you need it. The problem with that is when you hit a bump in the road, what you need isn't there and isn't going to get there. And so redundancy and having additional supplies and alternatives becomes critical in survival. And I think that we have learned and need to incorporate the concept that responsible governance in the public and private sector does require resilience and, and redundancy. Um, so I think those are the two great lessons. And then the third lesson I would say, which is a more general one, is that we are very reliant on supply chains and the various elements that we incorporate into our finished products or our finished um, oper operational activities. And when those get interrupted, either because of a natural disaster <clears throat> or because of some political or geopolitical issue, we can find ourselves in deep trouble if we don't have alternative sources of supply. So I think building supply chains and building alternatives is another important takeaway from what we are experiencing. I was going to ask you, uh, going to ask you about supply chains. So Deutsche Bank, uh, as we speak, has just put out a report saying or predicting that uh, supply chains will be more uh, become more continental as opposed to global, which is an interesting uh, development. And if if it does happen, or an interesting prediction, and if it does happen, that would uh, have positive effects on on global uh, CO two emissions as well. But I was going to ask you, uh, supply chains are vulnerable and. But the thing is that, that they are not related to governments. This is something that, that industry arranges for, arranges for itself. Um, every company arranges for itself. So how can we as, as um, or how can governments uh, help supply chains become more stable or, or more uh, durable, more resilient when they themselves are not really involved in the business of transporting goods around the world or in, in running companies? Well, gov uh, <clears throat> governments can play a role. First of all, I, I would say that some governments have been playing a role in supply chains. The Chinese, for example, subsidize companies. They provide an internal market, which enables companies to grow. And that's one of the reasons Huawei and similar tech companies in China have been able to offer a wide variety of services at quite competitive prices because they're getting assistance from their governments. I'm not suggesting that Western governments go in that direction, but we should recognize governments are playing a role. So what can Western governments do? I think we can, first of all, um, create among ourselves, and I don't think this is a go it alone for each country, a marketplace that encourages investment in those technologies in particular, which are mission critical for our national security. 
So for example, you know, one of the things we've seen with 5G, which is going to become even more important in a post virus world, is that there are not many suppliers of the critical chips infrastructure, um, software and hardware that we need to build out 5G at a global level. And if we're reliant on one company, Huawei, we're putting ourselves at risk. So one of the things that I've suggested along with um, colleagues in the US, Europe and Japan is creating a marketplace um, for 5G equipment in the Western liberal democracies, assisting them with um, making more bandwidth available, making more, more of the frequencies available so that there's actually an economic incentive to invest and creating favorable trade conditions to promote that investment. That would enable the private sector to exploit our natural innovation by developing at scale the kinds of tools you need to build out 5G. Following up on, on your point uh, about supply chains, uh, I wanted to, to uh, make a, a more general question, which is, um, our Western societies have uh, limited governments and, and governments don't own a lot of companies. In fact, they own barely any companies at all. And yet we rely in, in, in the crisis uh, and, and in future crises, we will rely on companies to, to help the government and, and, and for them to do the right thing. How can governments incentivize uh, companies or encourage companies to, to step up to the plate and do the right thing in, in resilience planning and, and uh, response? Well, I actually think there are legal, regulatory, and, and tax tools that can be used to drive more social, socially responsible behavior at the corporate level. Until recently, the general legal rule in the U.S. at least was that corporate responsibility and fiduciary duty on the part of the management was largely to drive shareholder value. And that's a very narrow vision of what results in good investment and good corporate behavior. What we've begun to see from the standpoint of employees, stakeholders, and customers is a greater insistence on a broader set of investments and results from corporations. And what we need to do is have the law and regulatory authorities signal to companies that they will be judged and they'll be required to be transparent about how they are dealing with a broader set of investments, not out of a sense of just some kind of altruism, but because real value creation is more than next quarter's financial results to bump the stock up. It's about investing for the long term, which means cultivating your employees, making sure your stakeholders and customers are happy, and even investing in your communities because that creates enduring value. So having government redefine more broadly what is value will drive ultimately corporate behavior. And, and very uh, quickly, do you think that resilience will move uh, towards something like a corporate social responsibility where every company today feels uh, the ethical uh, obligation or, or even perhaps shareholder pressure to show that it's doing the right thing? Do you think we could, we could move resilience to, to such a, a position where companies feel that it's in their interest to do the right thing because uh, their uh, shareholders and, and uh, clients and customers will, will uh, reward them for it? I absolutely believe that is possible. I think it will happen because I think the experience that we've had in the last six months has taught people that you can pay a very heavy price, both from a business standpoint and a personal standpoint, if you don't have resilience. And I think more and more you're going to see in a variety of settings that a broader sense of corporate social responsibility will take hold, not necessarily because corporate executives all of a sudden are possessed with a tremendous sense of altruism, but because the employees and the customers and the stakeholders are going to demand it. And I think having that broader view of what value is in a corporation, as opposed to the very narrow view that just measures you know, what, the, what the stock price is, will ultimately be a good thing for capitalism. Michael Chertoff, thank you very much for joining us and thank you all for watching.